Bene, detto questo, allora possiamo sicuramente passare alla seconda parte, diciamo, del nostro evento. È il secondo evento, diceva giustamente il padre elettore, perché da una parte abbiamo la presentazione del libro, ma c'è anche l'altro evento, è la presenza del professor Wilkis tra noi. E, e quindi siamo veramente molto lieti di avere il direttore dell'Onergan Research Institute di Toronto. Eh, a Toronto eh, c'è la casa madre, direi, dell'archivio di Lonergan, eh? quindi andare a Toronto significa veramente poi andare a respirare eh, un'area totalmente lonerganiana, nel senso che poi non soltanto abbiamo, abbiamo i vari volumi già pubblicati, ma negli archivi sono conservati tantissimi altri documenti. Alcuni nostri studenti eh, anche quest'estate sono andati, alcuni dottorandi eh, sono andati a Toronto e hanno anche eh, affabilmente ricevuto la parola del professor Wilkis che si dedica molto anche alle relazioni con eh, gli studiosi chiaramente ma anche con studenti che sono in ricerca. Bene, a lei la parola. Grazie. Grazie. Yes, if, if I might just um, complete a little bit the introduction to uh, Professor uh, Wilkins, to Jeremy, if I may um, call him so. Uh, the, just a, on a personal note, I have known Jeremy uh, since the middle 1990s. Uh, when I was doing my doctorate in Toronto, on Lonergan, um, Jeremy was a very bright master's student, uh, notable for, well, not being a Jesuit, uh, a, f a friend of many of the Jesuits uh, studying there, a particularly gifted uh, uh, student with a very clear lay vocation in, in theology, having chosen, having been capable to have pursued other walks of life, but choosing theology as a lay person it was very notable. Um, the, uh, Jeremy was born in Houston? I was born in Akron. Oh, Akron, Ohio, excuse me. Um, moved around a bit, I, I recall. I could never really uh, keep track of it. The family moved around. Um, the, gained his bachelor's degree in uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Then Regis College, completing in 1997 his MDiv. He moved to Boston College for a PhD, which he finished in 2004. Completed his dissertation on the development of Thomas Aquinas' Trinitarian theology. From 2004 to 10, he worked as a professor in the University of St. Thomas School of Theology, Houston, Texas, where he was granted tenure. In 2012, he was appointed director of the Lonergan Research Institute, Toronto, where his responsibilities include, as well as being part of the Regis <coughs> College Theology faculty, an oversight of the publication of the collected works of Bernard Lonergan. He is also a frequent speaker to general audience, uh, audiences on religious and theological topics. Jeremy is married to Maureen and has two sons, Abraham and Tom, and Abraham is 15 years old. So the years pass uh, uh, quickly. Uh, um, Jeremy wasn't married yet when I knew him. <laughs> Research interests of Jeremy uh, are uh, very much in Thomas Aquinas as well as Lonergan. He's uh, considered a very competent Thomist uh, scholar. Uh, method in theology, Trinitarian theology, Christology, and grace. He is a manuscript referee for theological journals, including Theological Studies, The Thomist, Nova et Vetera, Irish Theological Quarterly, University of Toronto Press, and Catholic University of America Press. Now, there's a very long list of articles published. I won't um, read them all to you. But uh, just to start with saying his monograph in process uh, should be out uh, before the end of this academic year, Ordering Theology, Method and Performance in the Thought of Bernard Lonergan. Uh, I'm struck by the similarities with the theme of the conference, Method, Performance. Just a couple of the uh, titles of, of articles. Metaphysics and Theology, Lonergan and Doran. Love and Knowledge of God in the Human Life of Christ. Why Two Divine Missions. 
Augustine, Aquinas, Lonergan, and many more. So, thank you, Jeremy. We're, um, I've already read the paper you're going to give. Um, I know how good it is, how interesting it is, and uh, I look forward to our, a lively discussion that we will have from this very large audience when you're finished. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate the warm introduction. I'm happy to say that I've revised the paper to put you at the same disadvantage as everyone else. Um, uh, when, when I, uh, so, so I guess let me begin by thanking all of you for coming. It's, it's wonderful to have so large an audience. Um, you, you, you might imagine how intimidating you are to, to, to come into an audience of people that you know distributively know a lot more stuff than you do <laughs> and to pretend to say something to them in, in the form of a Lectio Magistralis. This is my first time giving a presentation under that particular title. Uh, but I appreciate Father Jerry's invitation and I appreciate Father de Mortier and, and Rosanna and the, the really wonderful uh, uh, welcome and introduction that I've received. I, when, when I knew Jerry in Toronto, I didn't yet have a beard. I, I then taught boys high school and realized I needed to grow one. Uh, and uh, this morning or this afternoon at lunch, Father de Mortier said that my beard seemed grayer than when I was here two years ago. And I, I've earned it. It's because my children are teenagers now. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, thank you all for, for coming out. Um, uh, I, I have a printout of my paper, but I, I just can't stop myself from revising it every time I read it. So I'm, I'm going to read it off my screen here, and hopefully that won't distract you too much. Um, uh, the, the, I'll be abbreviating some pieces as I go, but um, anyway, those are the breaks. Um, so, so I agreed to speak on the significance of Lonergan for theology today. A theology mediates between religion and culture, and as there are many different cultures, theologies today is not the same everywhere. And what follows, I have in mind mainly the challenges presented by the cultural situation most familiar to me, which is the United States and Canada, or as we say over there, North America, omitting Mexico and the Caribbean. I must leave it to you to judge the extent to which I, what I have to say is relevant to your own contexts. My thesis in brief is this. Lonergan is important today because the central issue in theology is the adequacy of theologians to their task. We are facing a cultural crisis of normativity. We have discovered the radical contingency of our traditions. Many leap gaily to the conclusion that if the tradition is not normative, it's merely arbitrary. Others labor in vain to put the genie back in the bottle, restore some sense of normative tradition. The culture bifurcates into opposed camps, each confirming the suspicions and thereby reinforcing the errors of its opponents. Christians, meanwhile, have lost their Christian native language, in, in a way that I'll say more about presently, and therefore tend to, to think of themselves or understand themselves in terms they learn from their culture. They are therefore easily trapped as you may have noticed, in the oppositions that the culture provides for them. A new foundation is needed both for a new enculturation of the gospel and for effective healing and creating in our civilization. But that foundation can only be, it seems to me, not a theory, but the concrete reality of the theologian in her intelligence, in her rationality, in her freedom, in her love and self-surrender. What Lonergan proposes is to make these topics explicit. His strategy is not a theory, 
so much as a set of practices, practices of self-knowledge, self-attention, what he calls self-appropriation, practices of methodical collaboration, and a, a, a practice of attention to the significance, the foundational significance of self-surrender in love. Self-knowledge, knowing ourselves as created participations of uncreated light, as incarnations of intelligence, reason, responsibility, knowing that truth is normative for intelligence and value is normative for freedom, methodical collaboration, knowing that knowing what we are doing when we're doing theology and self-surrender in love, knowing that the highest wisdom is not learned, but something given and taken in a lifetime's death in love, ardor and selflessness and self-surrender. And if you're wondering why that last little bit was so good, it's because I was cribbing from T.S. Eliot. I begin with a brief characterization of some salient features of the com contemporary situation. There is no doubt, wrote Walter Casper, that the outstanding event in the Catholic theology of our century is the surmounting of neo-scholasticism. Neo-scholasticism he describes as the attempt to solve the modern crisis with a timeless, unified theology that would provide a norm for the universal church. Almost in the twinkling of an eye, that effort was swept away, and with it, many older and more admirable achievements. For some eight centuries, scholastic thought provided theology a set of common questions and a standard framework for articulating results. Neo-scholasticism, unfortunately, tended to incarnate some of scholasticism's weakest tendencies, ahistorical mobility, abstractness, antiquated science, a predilection for logic over discovery, and proof over understanding. It went hand in glove with a set of cultural assumptions and an educational system oriented to the permanent things, the eternal, the unchanging. This is what Lonergan called classicist culture, with its pretense to universality and normativity, resistant to innovation, blind to meaningful differences and to the positivity, the possibility of a positiveness in pluralism. Uh, I, I, I note briefly in passing, this style of culture is not, um, uh, Lonergan is thinking of what he knew of, of the Catholic, uh, European, and North American culture, but we find this style in lots of different places. That is, a tendency of lots of cultures to think of their culture as the universal normative culture against which every other culture is, is regarded as barbaric. It is, however, 50 years since Vatican II, 60 since insight, 40 since method and theology. Maybe less in Rome than in most other places, neo-scholasticism seems to be a long time gone to most people. Most theologians of my generation know neo-scholasticism almost not at all, except as this kind of um, bugbear that was opposed by the, the great figures of the last century. To my students, when they read Lonergan's descriptions of it, it seems like they must be stilted. It's a kind of caricature. But even if they're not stilted, it just reinforces the sense we may have that Lonergan's today is not our today. He was fighting some other set of battles. Theology today has little need of prophets to call it to historical seriousness, to dialogue with the natural sciences, to engagement with existential, hermeneutical, postmodern philosophy. Mission accomplished, as we Americans say. Let us move on. But the story has another side, for neo-scholasticism was the intellectual arm of a culture. 
and its disappearance was not only the failure of an intellectual project, but also the destruction of a cultural form. Their collapse left many educated Catholics in a state of almost complete disorientation, feeling confronted with an endless relativism and unequipped to deal effectively and successfully with the premises set forth by relativists. You, you, you know the story, that people had the sense of the unchanging church and then suddenly it changed and the sense is everything must be up for grabs. What isn't up for grabs? That disorientation is with us still. It is in fact, it seems to me, inseparable from a wider cultural crisis in the West, a crisis of meaning and values of authority and tradition, a crisis of our working relation to the past. The crisis is a fallout, it seems to me, from a momentous transformation stemming from twin revolutions, the revolution of natural science and the revolution of historical knowledge. These revolutions, they define modernity. When I, uh, Catholic leaders responded to modernity in a remarkably uncreative and flat-footed manner. That, that's, a, that's a bald thing to say, maybe especially here in Rome, but I'm thinking of Pius X's and the responses around that time uh, it, it, that were hobbled by their involvement in classicist culture and their failure to grasp how radical was the transformation in our scientific knowledge of nature and our historical knowledge of human beings. The transformation was misjudged as if it were just a series of regrettable aberrations that unfortunately were widely accepted when in fact it was a single momentous event demanding an equally momentous development in Catholic thought and education. For too long, the strategy was to wall the crisis out. Uh, even, even having people in the oath against modernism, you, you, had to, you had to take an oath the things that you knew <laughs> couldn't be right. But you were, you were swearing that you wouldn't admit them uh, that strategy never was tenable. When inevitably it was abandoned for lost, the storm was all the fiercer for the weight. Uh, just, just to give one quick example of, of a thing, because uh, some of you may be su surprised to hear me say these things, but one of the things that, you, one of the opinions you were not to entertain was the opinion that Catholics might be divided over whether the temporal sovereignty of the Pope was a good thing or not a good thing. Uh, one was not to entertain this position. Um, Catholicism is still struggling, it seems to me. So having lost this kind of culture that Catholicism had achieved, it's still struggling to enculturate in the resulting situation. And, and it seems to me uh, we, 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 we lost a kind of native language that we had developed and so we're inheriting the native languages of our culture. And the native languages of our culture, at least in the United States and, and to a significant extent in Canada, in, of, of my experience, are possessive individualism, getting and spending, expressive individualism, to thine own self be true, and relative perspectivism, it works for me. Those, those have become sort of our native languages, even as Christians. We're raised in those languages and understand ourselves first that way. The challenge for theology in this context is to help the church find its own native voice in our culture. The challenge, however, is all the more difficult because we, as Christians and as theologians, are not exempt from those derailments of our culture. As Fred Lawrence points out, those languages have invaded us. If then we would learn Christ, we start not with a blank slate, but with conversion and repentance, because we must turn away from the ways that our culture offers us to interpret our desires and needs, our conflicts and our struggles, 
we must dissent from the scale of values implied culturally uh, and embedded in our social practices and institutional arrangements. We must become like children and learn a new, a Christian language, but we must be adults in working out what that may mean here and now. Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor compares our situation to Matteo Ricci's. We are missioned not to a culture strange to us, but to a culture in some ways strange to the gospel or alienated from it, a culture itself in crisis, a culture, however, to which we also belong. I'm going to skip a little bit. The contemporary crisis of culture is a crisis of normativity, a crisis attendant on the discovery that our cultures are our, our, our products and our products are not normative. The result of this transition is a kind of dialectical feedback loop. The need for norms is felt until the need is met in a satisfactory manner. There are bound to be many who perceive the rejection of classicism as a rejection of all norms. Not a few, you may have noticed, rejoice at the liberation. And in their rejoicing, they furnish abundant suspicions, abundant evidence to confirm the suspicions on the solid right, where the revival of something very like neo-scholasticism in thought and classicism in culture cannot but seem the appropriate remedy. The scattered left, on its part, resists their efforts as revanchism. But the real solution is to lay the ax to the root of the tree. That is, to find a way of acknowledging relativity without becoming relativist, to be responsible to history without becoming historicist, to, uh, uh, to acknowledge modern natural science without succumbing to the, relativi uh, the uh, reductionism that, that so often preys upon it. Lonergan writes, uh, well, well, let me set this up in a different way. It, it seems to me then Lonergan is a kind of reproach to both houses to a solid right unequal to the tradition's best questions and to a scattered left that has no use for them. There are those, he writes, that resentfully and disdainfully brush aside the old questions of cognitional theory, epistemology, metaphysics. I have no doubt, I never did doubt, that the old answers were defective. But to reject the question as well is to refuse to know what one is doing when one is knowing. It is to refuse to know why doing that is knowing. It is to refuse to set up a basic semantics, a metaphysics, by concluding to what one knows when one does it. That threefold refusal is worse than the mere neglect of the subject and it generates a far more radical truncation. It is that truncation that we experience today not only without but within the church when we find the conditions of the possibility of significant dialogue are not grasped, when the distinction between revealed religion and myth is blurred, when the possibility of objective knowledge of God's existence and his goodness is denied. It is not enough then to name what is not normative, to cast down the idol of misplaced normativity. We have to name and to know in ourselves what is normative. There is no other way we as theologians can be adequate to our tradition and calling. What Lonergan proposes is a difficult remedy and it is easy to take it as license to name the vices of the old regime while putting little in its place. My next section, <clears throat> self-knowledge, wisdom as self-knowledge and self-appropriation. <clears throat> 
What is normative in the first instance, what needs no critical justification is the light of intelligence, questions and wonder as facts that in some way we incarnate. Lonergan's proposal is not normative as an argument in a book, it's normative as a structure in you, in us. It's not normative as formulated as a set of propositions, it's normative as operative, as a set of operative, of normative practices. His, his program, his essential program and insight, his essential proposal is discover this in yourself. There's a normativity in, in your intelligence, in you as a created participation of the light of, 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 uh, of, of the uncreated light of divine intelligence. The normativity of questions means the normativity of the criteria imminent in questioning. When you, when you pose a question, it, it somehow includes the criteria for what could be a satisfactory answer. The normativity of the criteria means, correlatively, the performative normativity of truth for intelligence and of value for decision. You're oriented towards that. You can ignore it at your peril. That normativity is not lodged in the objects of our judgment or choice. It's lodged in the imminent, spontaneously operative criteria of judgment and choice. What is easy is repeating and notionally affirming what Lonergan says. Experience, understanding, judgment, decision. There's a lot of people say that. What is also easy is finding reasons to disagree with him. What is difficult is the asceticism that he presents to us. Know thee se auton, know thyself. It's a hard trick. What I'd like to do now is characterize what I call, what, what Fred Lawrence calls Lonergan's absolute perspectivism that stems from this. Um, uh, so I'll do that briefly. In, in his influential book, Natural Right and History, Leo Strauss points out that the modern crisis of natural right rests on a critique of the possibility, a critique of the possibility of transcultural objectivity. Claims to the contrary are regarded as quote unquote dogmatic in the pejorative sense that they rest upon an arbitrary premise, namely the assumption that, the, that being is, can be identified with the intelligible. According to the historicist critique, as Strauss represents it, this presupposition has its root in the dogmatic identification of to be, in the highest sense, with to be always. The dogmatic character of the basic premise is said to have been revealed by the discovery of history or of the historicity of human life. In other words, we discovered history and all of a sudden realized all these judgments are relative. They're historically conditioned and historically relative, and therefore relativity is in and, and objective absolute judgment is out. What the relatives, this relativists discovered is the important fact that whatever may be hymned about eternal truths, human judgments always involve a specification of time. While this is certainly the case, it follows only that judgments are relative to a context, not that they are only relatively true. Indeed, the virtually unconditioned of rational judgment, that is, grasping that the evidence is sufficient to affirm, is the sine qua non for authentic conversation. If there's no possibility of attaining the virtually unconditioned, if there's no possibility of rational judgment, of having a rational basis for affirming or denying, then there's also no possibility of having a meaningful conversation that makes any progress in some other fashion than, than coercion or group think. Uh, it, it also perhaps goes without saying that if there's no possibility of rational judgment, there's also no possibility of drawing the historicist judgment and rationally affirming it. It remains the case that that rational judgment is, is contingent, is perspectival, 
But as far as it goes, it's absolutely true. If the evidence is sufficient for an affirmation, then that at least can be affirmed. So the possibility of the virtually unconditioned is the possibility of significant dialogue. And without it, conversation must degenerate into power games. Lonergan acknowledges perspective because he recognizes that there's a conversational situation. Not everyone has the same questions. Not everyone has the same experiences. Judgment is relative to contexts. But he also recognizes the possibility of achieving, or more commonly approaching, the virtually unconditioned, the, 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 uh, uh, um, the illative sense in Newman and therefore of arriving at judgments that are true in the attended sense and cannot be truthfully denied. Thus, his is an absolute perspectivism in contrast to the relative perspectivism or simply relativism that seems typical of postmodern thought. Now, I have a further discussion of the problem of, um, of moral judgment in relation to the, the postmodern critiques that tend to end up in a kind of arbitrariness. Uh, but I'm going to skip that because I have too many things going on in this paper. And who knows if those are the ones that the respondents decided to talk about. I can pull the rug out from under them. Lonergan reminded his students that to be of service to others, it was necessary that they first exist authentically themselves, lest the blind lead the blind and he said one of the things that was important in this was that you aim to help people be converted and grow in authenticity rather than just proving them wrong. And I, I'll never forget when I defended my dissertation, one of my readers very charitably pointed out the sections in which I had really advanced things and the sections in which I had just settled for proving people wrong. <laughs> And he, he did it by reading this passage from Lonergan. Uh, but it, but it, that, 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 this business of existing authentically so that you can be of service to people was Lonergan's way of talking about the eminently practical question, which is, what's the right way to live? And it turns out that the problem of getting things right in theology or philosophy is intimately related to living in the right way. Since there's no, there's, no, there's no way that science or scholarship or philosophy or theology in the end can be genuine except by heading one in the direction of becoming an authentic human being, of standing faithfully by questions and so forth. In the end, knowing like loving is a kind of self-surrender where the quality of the surrender cannot be disengaged from the quality of the self. So I'm going to skip to the next section, which is theology as a, which is, which as the slide says is order in theology. Uh, and uh, uh, so let me say a few things about that. What time did I start, Jerry? Loads of time. Uh, philosophy uh, uh, Lonergan, Lonergan uh, here let me let me read a transition paragraph. For for a post classicist philosophy, Lonergan averred. First principles can no longer be verbal propositions, but rather the, first, the de facto first principles are the invariance of human conscience, conscious inten intentionality. That is the fact we can verify in ourselves of, of wonder generating questions that have criteria imminent in them and that criteria can't simply be disregarded. They have to be stood by. The invariance involved in the structure of question and answer, formulation and testing, reflection and judgment, evaluation and decision, 
what was called speculative intellect names in fact a specific pattern of operations of attention, inquiry, rational reflection. But this performance is itself existential. It, it results, that is, from a moral deliberation, a moral evaluation, a decision about the right way to proceed, and a commitment to sticking to it. It's, it's in a way the question that Socrates was always posing that just annoyed the heck out of everybody he talked to. My children are reading um, uh, um, well, I can't remember which dialogue we're reading, but we're, it's, it's the one on rhetoric. And because um, I have too many faces staring at me for my memory to work. But, but, he's, but it, by annoying them, he's, he's really po putting to them the question, do you realize what you don't know and are you prepared to come clean about it? Are you prepared to, to, real, to, to take the position that being honest is more important than appearing right. And getting things right is more important than winning arguments. It's the Gorgias. The primacy then belongs to, to practical intellect in the sense that practical intellect is what selects the way to proceed and the way to be. And philosophy then becomes a philosophy of action. It becomes a philosophy of action when the task of wisdom is seen to be guiding the selection of an appropriate method. Lonergan by method means a lot. But guiding the selection of appropriate method and sticking to it. And uh, he recognized that the central issue in theology is the equality of the theologian to her task, to the demands of her tradition and the challenges of her culture. That adequacy in itself is not a theological operation, but the result of momentous personal transformations. The overarching purpose of method is to bring its implications into the light and confront them squarely. Lonergan, Lonergan, in Lonergan's analogical structure, the way he thinks about method and theology, he, he distinguishes it into a phase of hearing and saying where hearing is cumulative responsibility or cumulative involvement with the given, with meaning, with truth, with the tradition, and not just with the tradition, but with the persons who embody the tradition, and ultimately with God. The consummation of hearing in theology, as in life, is personal encounter, cor ad cor loquente, as Newman has it. As hearing culminates in personal encounter, so one's saying emerges from and discloses one's stance in the world, what I like to call readiness, one's readiness, thinking of, that, of Abraham when God says Abraham and he says ready, and God tells him to do the darndest things, but he's ready. What one is ready to do, what one is ready to approve or censure, what one is ready to believe or affirm or deny, what one is ready to understand or ask or even notice. Thus, in Lonergan's conception of a functionally differentiated theology, the, the control functions at the top are foundations and dialectic. And foundations for him, which is laying your cards on the table in the most explicit and honest way you can, it follows on dialectic which is the function of coming to terms with the real underlying reasons for the conflicts, the real issues at stake, because that leads you into personal encounter. He, he, his idea is you can't really do that without being invited to take a stand yourself and to articulate the reasons for your stand. So foundations follows dialectic, because the coming to light of your deepest commitments is one with personal encounter. It's one with discovering who it is you admire. You find yourself admiring others. The being of the subject is becoming, and the becoming is conversational. It's through friendship. Expanding on the relevance of self-appropriation to theology, Lonergan explains that the faith itself suffers when philosophical foundations are inadequate. 
Knowledge of method, he writes, becomes a necessity when false notions of method are current and more or less disastrous. He illustrates the disastrous consequences of false notions of method by the difficulty that is had conceiving doctrinal development. When doctrinal development is conceived along the lines of logical implication, then either the dogmas of the faith are logically implicit in scripture or they are not revealed in scripture at all. But, histor but historically responsible and logically, co and so he, he has this tart remark, by the way, that uh, there are those who aren't bothered by this because they're not any good at logic, and there are those who aren't bothered by this because they don't read scripture. <laughs> uh, but to be historically responsible and logically coherent in the way we handle scripture, we, we can't simply conclude that, that the scriptures provide premises from which the dogmas are validly deduced. The adequate solution to this dilemma is not to say either that the dogmas are not revealed or that they are revealed in some ongoing process of revelation in the church. Rather, Lonergan suggests the process from scripture to the dogmas is not a logical and deductive process, but a function of transformations of horizon, transformations in the kinds of questions and the way in which the questions are being posed, which correlatively are transformations in the persons doing the questioning. We reach the notion of method when we ask, how does one effect the transition from one universe of discourse to another? or more profoundly from one level or stage of human culture to another in moving, say, from Galilee to, uh, to Rome and to, and to Greece, the Socratic world. Let me understand, excuse me, let me understand is a good start for many things. Let me underline, however, four, five important aspects of Lonergan's clarification of functional specialties. The first is uh, functional specialization recognizes the priority of questions. Uh, this, this has multiple implications, but I won't go into them uh, now. But um, uh, uh, he, so, so anyway, it's, 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 it's he, he has the idea that theology has to be faithful to the questions that arise and can't be in the business of predetermining the questions that are allowed to arise. But you have to face the questions squarely. And there, there's a history for this in, in Lonergan, which is, as a scholastic, he was helped tremendously by studying Newman. And, and, and in particular, um, a saying of Cardinal Newman's, which was, 10,000 difficulties don't make one doubt which Lonergan understood to mean that the doubts are on the level of faith, the difficulties are on the level of understanding. And he says, this always held me in really good stead because I was able to face the difficulties squarely without feeling like somehow I was doubting my faith by admitting that there were things that were difficult and needed to be faced. Next, distinguishing and ordering functional specialties respects the autonomy of questions and resists the intrusion of alien criteria. In other words, it's a way of protecting different kinds of inquiry. If you're determining what Paul wrote, if you're determining what Paul meant, if you're trying to figure out how Paul fits into an historical process, those are all different, though functionally interrelated questions, and none of them is, 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 is properly answered or respected by saying what Paul must have wrote because of what the Council of Trent said about him or something like that. He wants to respect the autonomy of the questions. He does also want to figure it out, but he, uh, he, he, so theology in his sense is not one activity or one kind of question related to one kind of answer, but an interrelated set of activities, each with its own relatively autonomous questions, procedures, and criteria. A third point is distinguishing functions acknowledges that theology is, is an ongoing process of learning, that it's a collaborative process, and that it's really a conversational process. And I developed this by, by, by way of a contrast between um, the idea 
the idea of coming to know as learning and what that entails versus the idea of coming to know simply by looking and intuiting or something like that. But I'm not going to bother you with that because I'd like to leave time for a conversation. Uh, it, 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 as I already mentioned, my fourth point is it makes the problem of internal controls explicit. In other words, the controls aren't deductive. Like, like what's Aquinas doing to Augustine? If, if you read Aquinas on grace, all the substantial affirmations of Augustine on, 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 on divine sovereignty, human freedom, the priority of grace, and so forth, they're all there, but they're completely transformed by being put in this theoretical context that has all these differentiations to it. What's the basis on which you judge something like that to be a valid move or an invalid move? And, and what's the basis on which you sort it out with your conversation partners, some of whom want to say, oh no, what Augustine does to Aquinas is not right. And others may want to say and what Aquinas does to, to the earlier tradition and so forth. Okay, so he doesn't have a silver bullet for that, but his idea is bring that all into the light, make explicit the problems and lay out what the criteria you have are so that that can be a topic of conversation too explicitly. Finally, uh, there's this issue of the concreteness of a functionally specialized theology. That it begins with data, it ends with the pastoral communication which is concrete, it has a finality towards the concreteness of, of pastoral uh, agency, but the, but the middle of the process for him is the concreteness of the theologian paying attention trying to figure out carefully what she's doing and what the norms of it are and, and being attentive and, and faithful to them. This leads me to my, what you'll be happy to hear is my last section. And that is the normativity for him of, of otherworldly love which is not normative as a theory about grace. It's not normative as named or objectified or formulated or affirmed. It's normative as a reality in persons, as a reality in Christians and theologians. And it's correlative to the beloved, the normativity of Christ with whom we fall in love and, and to whom we surrender ourselves. Returning to the concrete is also returning to oneself, to the imperfect wisdom of the theologian. If materially the starting point of theology is data, existentially the starting point of, the, of theology is the theologian. Her horizon determines what questions can even arise, what could even be noticed. Um, there's a lovely Flannery O'Connor short story called... Um, uh, it's called uh, Green Leaf. And um, I, I use this in my grace course because there, he, she does this third person narration of this woman who, who um, in her brokenness, just interprets everything that's happening around her, you know, and through this kind of relentless, relentlessly sort of selfish and, and, um, um, uh, um, suspicious kind of hermeneutic and so no matter what's presented to her all the evidence is refracted through this same kind of ungenerous perspective until the end when the transformation happens but it's a beautiful thing about conversion and the priority of love in transforming the horizon uh, w which makes it new noticing possible Conversion is a transformation of the subject and of the world of her involvement. She, she, by conversion, we become new selves involved with a world that's made new to us, and, our, and, and we become ourselves principles of further change. For, for us as Christians, this, is, this, is, this happens as we experience ourselves as, as called. It's not that we have some kind of imminent experience called religion, religious experience and then decide to attach it to some fortuitous tradition. It's that we experience ourselves as addressed, as summoned, as, 
summoned to hammer and to hearken day and night, if I may mangle a quotation. If we hearken, it's because we have hearts to hearken and ears to hear. This, this involves us in making Christ the explicit focal point of our lives. As he lived his life in relation to us, so we work out our lives in relation to him and in relation to all those who belong to him. In Christ, we learn, this, we learn the, that the touchstone of religious authenticity is God's purpose to bring good out of evil through love. Lonergan calls this the law of the cross. It's the efficacious way of our redemption because it was Christ who made it his own with a holy, gratuitous solidarity with us. He enacted it in his paschal mystery in such, in such a way that every other instance of bringing good out of evil is at least implicitly a participation in that mystery. Wherever love brings good out of evil, there is a walking in the way of the Paschal mystery, even if neither the way nor the walking are known. There's an involvement with Christ, even if that involvement is mediated by other meanings than those of the biblical and Christian tradition, and even if it's obscured by the veils that we Christians ourselves have become for many. The law of the cross is the touchstone for religious authenticity. We recognize it through that wisdom that's the infused gift of the Spirit and makes us docile to the Spirit's guidance and gives us the ears to hear. It's a criterion for separating the wheat from the chaff in our own tradition and in others we encounter. Whatever disposes to genuine reconciliation, to forgiveness, to patient endurance, to gratitude, is an instrument of the good that God works in all things. And on the contrary, the sacralization of violence and revenge, the rationalization of injustice, these are derailments no less when they occur in our tradition than when we find them elsewhere. For Christians, this foundational claim is attached to a doctrine. Christ alone adequately determines the meaning of conversion. But in thinking about the problem of recovering a Christian native language, it seems to me the law of the cross, this mystery, has to be central to it, to how we interpret our desires and our struggles and our conflicts. I was asked, by way of conclusion, there was much rejoicing. I was asked to say something about Lonergan's significance today. I have tried to answer by pointing to his program of self-knowledge, to his way of acknowledging relativity without succumbing to relativism, to his proposal for a methodical conversational theology, his teaching that the highest wisdom is self-surrender, and the highest self-surrender is to Christ in love. But Lonergan's answers will be relevant only to those for whom the questions are up. What he has to say will be relevant to you if you grasp that it is about you more than it's about Lonergan. The relevance of Lonergan first and foremost is the relevance of you, that is, the significance of the theologian for theology today. I thank you very much for your patient endurance. Bene, molte grazie professor Wilkis per la sua relazione che ha il nome antico di Lectio Magistralis ma ha tutti i contenuti poi della contemporaneità di una comunicazione eh, molto vivace in ordine alle problematiche veramente del nostro tempo di oggi ci sono tutte le nuove esigenze, sono state delineate le nuove esigenze per la teologia ma sicuramente sono esigenze anche che eh, ogni cultura di ogni sapere, quindi anche per i filosofi, per coloro che appartengono ad altre aree disciplinari, sicuramente hanno trovato nella sua relazione elementi di riflessione eh, preziosi. Certamente la crisi della cultura invoca eh, una ricerca del tutto particolare eh, 
anche su nuovi stadi di significati e su questo fronte siamo tutti poi chiaramente anche impegnati proprio per combattere quel relativismo sempre più diffuso e per impegnarci invece per una relatività che eh, non sia un relativismo, per una storicità che non sia storicismo. Quindi di fronte a una crisi di significati e di valori il pensiero di Bernard Lonergan eh, ci propone eh, una sapienza intesa come autoconoscenza e self-appropriation, autoappropriazione. Ci eh, propone una conversione intellettuale per raggiungere quei livelli di autenticità, autenticità del soggetto, autenticità delle comunità umane. Quindi una struttura conversa, conversionale, direi, nell'esistenza storica. Eh, bene, allora direi che adesso alla ricca relazione possiamo anche mh, proporre a due relatori presenti in sala, il professor Kevin Flannery prima e poi il professor Paul Hoara, di dare una risposta, una prima risposta nei tempi limitati che abbiamo a quanto il professor Wilkins ci ha proposto. Grazie. Quindi il padre Flannery, sì, il professor Flannery. Tante grazie, professoressa Finamore, per questa presentazione, anche al professore Che Wilkins per, per un saggio, <coughs> un discorso bellissimo, e anche grazie per questo, questa opportunità di dire alcune cose, cioè quanto a, a ciò che è stato già presentato. Ma parlerò io in inglese, e abbastanza brevemente. While reading yesterday the first couple pages of Professor Wilkins' paper, in which he discusses the crisis of post-Vatican II Church brought on by, and I quote, the demise of classicism and its intellectual arm, neo-scholasticism, I thought of beginning my comments this evening by quoting that old saw by Mark Twain. That is, uh, that the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Can shady to her. <laughs> well, you see, I have now quoted it. Although, having read and now heard the rest of Professor Wilkins' very fine paper, I'm now not at all sure that what I thought of arguing had been issued prematurely a death certificate is what Lonergan or Pro Professor Wilkins maintains has died. Personally, I have never had a teacher who, by any stretch, stretch of the definition, could be described as a neo-scholastic. But I'm willing to, willing to grant, at least for the sake of argument, that the lectures of the neo-scholastics were as deadly, even apparently to their own discipline, as they are represented. The point I wish to make, however, in these brief remar remarks, is that the list of shortcomings attributed to the neo-scholastics by Bernard Lonergan certainly do not characterize the one classical writer with whom I have the most familiarity, that is, Aristotle. And I quote now uh, Professor Wilkins, time and time again we read him, that is, Lonergan, inveighing against the defects of neo-scholasticism. A historical immobility, its abstractness, its antiquated science, its predilection, predilection, predilection for logic over discovery, proof over understanding. Unquote. None of these descriptions characterizes the philosophy of Aristotle. Is it because Aristotle was a keen historian of philosophy that a large percentage of the fragments of the pre-Socratics that we have survived in the first place. He characteristically begins his treatment of a general topic, physics for instance, or ethics, with a summary of what his predecessors thought, the endoxa, the reputable opinions. 
nor can his methodology be characterized as immobile. When, for instance, he speaks of the laws of the various poles, the cities, Greek, Greek cities, he does say that those which are traditional, that is, the laws which are traditional, are owed respect. But he also says that if they are shown not to be just, they must be abandoned. And I quote what he says. If politics is an art, he says, change must be necessary in this as in any art. Regarding abstractness, Aristotle was its initial and its fiercest enemy. The very upshot of his theory of substance and the very basis of his metaphysics is that substances cannot be universals. Essences themselves are found, at least in their first instance, in concrete particulars. Nor can Aristotle be accused of propounding antiquated science. In the scientific section of his metaphysics, he relies on the most advanced science of his day, that of Eudoxus, who was also his senior colleague. And while expounding Eudoxus' theory of the movement of the heavenly bodies, he makes it very apparent that he does not regard that theory as in any sense definitive. Regarding the academic discipline of logic, although Aristotle describes himself correctly as its inventor, he is well aware of its limits. Possibly his most fundamental principle that is, besides the principle of non-contradiction, is that not everything can be demonstrated, proved, that is, by means of apodictic syllogisms. Even such demonstrations as are possible in the sciences begin necessarily, he says, with discovery. And as is well known, Aristotle was not only the inventor of logic, but also the author of several works on biology, which in involved a great deal of investigation and discovering. I could go on in this fashion, but I will conclude with a point regarding ethics, whose universal precepts appear to have been of particular concern to Bernard Lonergan. No one who reads the Nicomachean Ethics would ever say that its methodology is a deductive one. Even the section in which Aristotle discusses most prominently the so-called practical syllogism has to do not with deductions of what one should do from universal precepts, but rather with how our consideration of things we might choose to do looks to goods or ends that we might achieve through various means. His general point in this section of the ethics is that practical reasoning occurs at a level, the level of practical perception, below and closer to us than the logic he puts forth in his syllogistic. None of this is to say, however, that Aristotle does not recognize moral absolutes, moral precepts that apply universally, whether one is a citizen of Athens, Greece, or Athens, Ohio, which is not far from, whether one is a fan of the ancient wrestler Milo of Croton, Apparently, Aristotle was a fan because he's mentioned in the Nicomachean Ethics. So whether, it was, whether one is a fan of Milo or a fan of Notre Dame football. It is always immoral, says Aristotle, to steal, to murder, to commit adultery, and to lie. If this, if this constitutes ahistorical immobility, so be it. We all prefer, I presume, a world in which stealing, murder, adultery, and lying are not encouraged. Thank you. Bene. Grazie, eh, Professor Feneri, per le sottolineature, le indicazioni. E ascoltiamo adesso la seconda risposta dal Professor Paul Hoara. Sì, sono molto stretto, perciò non dico troppo. Anche io parlo in inglese, è più facile anche per me. Um, for more than 35 years I taught mathematics, primarily at the university level in the United States. I am just two months now here in, in Italy. 
So after many years in the States, and I visited Akron, Ohio, and Toronto, in the mid-90s, the idea of calculus reform became very popular. With numerous textbooks being published and seminars being organized as part of the Harvard Consortium to help arrest what was perceived in mathematics circles as an inadequate preparation of students. The question arose as to whose fault was it? Some blamed the students, others blamed it on bad teaching. Regardless of who was to blame, one thing was certain. Good teaching requires both a good understanding of the material and an understanding and an empathy with the student's predicament. It seems to me that when Professor Wilkins writes that what Lonergan proposes seems more opaque and less relevant than ever, that he is describing a situation that is akin to the problem of math education, at least in the United States. The process of self-appropriation as required by Lonergan is not an easy task. And the road to intellectual conversion, where one grasps that isomorphism between the real and the known, where one realizes that knowing the known as knowing is an instance of the real from which it follows the real can be known, requires a tremendous amount of work. Indeed, the path from Kantian dualism to Lonergan's critical realism can only, be can only be appreciated by those who have already made the transition and done the hard work. Throughout the process, one can benefit greatly from a good teacher who knows how to guide the subject and help them realize their as yet undiscovered anticipations. So the first observation and or question is this. How good are people in the field of Lonerganian studies at motivating their students? Now, how effective are they as teachers? The second observation and question follows on this. In what way are scholars of Lonergan using general empirical method able to teach concepts without necessarily requiring that the students become experts in Lonergan? It seems to me that in order to develop a normative culture in which Lonergan's methodology has meaning, it is more important to implement his methodology at all levels without necessary having to wait for everyone to undergo intellectual conversion. And even that, I doubt, will forever fully happen. As an example of this, I would refer to, to a book, Brendan Purcell's book, which I just happen to have a copy of, From Big Bang to Big Mystery. You can ask me about it later. Those who are familiar with Lonergan's words will recognize and underline Lonerganian structure in the format of Purcell's book. However, the work is not about Lonergan. Rather, it is a work in philosophical anthropology, functioning on the level of explicit metaphysics, a la Lonerganian, to help the reader find meaning within the context of evolution and the mystery of creation. In other words, although Lonergan's empirical method is not in fo its focus, nevertheless, the book could never have been written in this way without the author having mastered general, generalized empirical method. Thirdly, I fully agree with Professor Wilkins that the transition from a classicist, classicist normative culture to a Christian postmodern normative culture has not yet taken place. Professor Wilson offers a response on the level of wisdom. However, I would like to take it one step further and ask, how might this wisdom become normative on the level of common sense? How do we produce a normative Christian identity within a postmodern culture? Some would say it's impossible. Perhaps, though, learning from the past might help. For example, my parents did not have a college education, but yet they were familiar with the Catholic Catechism, which was Ireland's equivalent to the Baltimore Catechism of the United States. It was something normative for them. Also underlying this normativity was a trust in the teachers and clergy who taught them. We might ask, what would be the equivalent to a Baltimore Catechism in our time? Certainly, the current catechism of the Catholic Church can be regarded as a first attempt at this, but I do not think it is the final version. Let me suggest that in looking at recent expressions of Pope Francis, we might discern something of what should be included in a future postmodern catechism. Expressions like, realities are more 
important than ideas, or time is greater than space, or my favorite, unity prevails over conflict, seem to be, to be examples of a normative value structure that can have popular appeal. Presumably, the people writing catechism would have, undergone, would have undergone intellectual, moral, and religious conversion. But to communicate this effectively, they would also need to be good teachers and have the common sense to know what will work and what will not work. Indeed, are not these type of expressions transformed into actions that make the current pope very popular and a reformer? He is just one example. I'm sure many of the Jesuit community here present could also quote numerous phrases from Ignatius of Loyola, just as I too could quote from Carla Lubick, I'm a member of the Focolari movement. Consider, for example, the phrase, it is better to be wrong in unity than to be right in disunity. Can you imagine what history would have been like if this phrase had been taken seriously? We probably would not have the divided church that we have today. It may seem impossible, but yet I know of children who are trained to think and act accordingly. Finally, so I have a conclusion. In the face of conflict, especially in our times, we have to ask what is needed to guarantee that unity prevails over conflict, which is a phrase of Pope Francis. And of course, the conflict is everywhere. It seems to me that the key is to be found in what Lonergan describes as the law of the cross. Professor Wilkins briefly, because I only had your text of yesterday, yes. Professor Wilkins briefly refers to it, but I think it requires a lot more development. Indeed, let me suggest that, in fact, historical consciousness can only be effectively achieved if this law mediates meaning in both our individual and collective lives as members of the church. Otherwise, there is being some type of already out there and now real void of meaning. It is not enough that Jesus lived the law of the cross. We, too, have to do it in order to be authentic. Indeed, based on my own focalary experience, this becomes more meaningful and fruitful when lived collectively. Let me also suggest that the law of the cross will also give a direct contribution in formulating a theology of the people which has so influenced Pope Francis. To conclude, I think Professor Wilkins has touched upon this sensitive area. His observations raise many questions which can only be answered meaningly if we recognize the primacy of love over intellectual conversion. Indeed, as Professor Wilkins points out, uh, quoting Lonergan, after his shift to intentionality analysis, Lonergan began to insist that love comes first. <laughs>